Hey guys, you know me. I'm not an especially patient man. I like quick wins with diplomatic victories, and I avoid messing around too much in the modern era. And a lot of players are the same way. They win or they give up on their games before it even gets there. So that leaves a lot of us wondering, what's actually going on in the modern era? How does the gameplay change when you have all the techs, or almost all the techs? Maybe you're looking to go deep for a space race victory, or maybe you want to play a single player game with a modern or future start. I got you covered. So I should say, everything in this video will reference the single player game. Modern and Future are very popular multiplayer mods, which I love to death. And because I've played them so much, I actually know a lot of things about the modern era, which is great because all of the things I'm going to tell you today are things that also apply to single player and that you can use in your single player games. Let's talk about the AI. The more features added into the game, the bigger advantage a human player has. In particular, the AI will just lose their workers by dropping radar towers at the start of the game, and they also insist on guarding every city with pricey units during the expansion phase. So if you play the modern or future start versus the AI, you will be at a bigger advantage than normal, and I'd recommend giving them some extra workers. If that sounds like fun, I'd be happy to cook that little scenario up for you guys. Okay, let's get started. Let's go through the tech tree. So first thing would be ir enables irrigation without fresh water. This is typically unlocked at electricity. If you play a modern or future start, you will begin with the game with this ability. You can irrigate anywhere pretty much. Next thing is enables bridges. So this one is typically unlocked at engineering. This means that if you have a road across a river, you don't take a movement penalty walking over that road. This one is at sanitation. Disables disease from floodplains. I can't explain it more clearly than that. So again, if you spawn in a game with a modern or future start, you will always have this ability from the beginning. Next up is Conscription. This is the draft. Typically, this is unlocked at nationalism. Very important ability. I will explain it in detail in a bit. After that, we have Mobilization. This is the wartime mode. Uh, this is also a very important ability. It is also unlocked at nationalism. I'll talk about it more in detail later. Next up is Recycling. A lot of people actually don't understand this one. Uh, this is a mystery in the multiplayer community, too. But what this actually is, because nobody gets this tech, but if you get the Recycling tech, this is the ability right here. Returns 25% of the shield cost when selling improvements in addition to the gold received. So if you don't need the granary anymore because you've reached maximum population, you could just sell the granary and not only do you get a bunch of gold, you'd get 15 shields back because the granary typically costs 60 shields. Next up we have precision bombing. This is a special type of bombing mission. Um, I believe it's the stealth fighter and the stealth bomber. Maybe the F-15? Um, ah, yes. So it's a separate tech. These two are the stealth planes. Smart weapons would unlock this ability. Um, it would target um, city buildings or population. Uh, this is the one at economics. Double work rate of workers. This is an important one. This is probably the most noticeable one if you're playing a modern or future start, is you start with replaceable parts, so you already have this ability. This ability is a huge deal. So you would mine in three turns instead of in, in six turns. Massive. Uh, after that, uh, this is not in single player game. Um, these ones, these are just the writing abilities, so embassies, stuff like that, uh, military alliances, trade embargoes. These two are kind of important, right? You can trade over sea tiles or ocean tiles. Um, you can do that with an airport regardless of if you have this ability or not. Uh, but if you're using over sea or ocean tiles, you need to have a cleared map between you and the player. Like, they're cannot be fog of war or barbarians blocking the sea route leading between your harbor and their harbor. Good thing you can enable map trading already because you start with navigation. Okay, and last one is reveal map. This one is typically at satellites or integrated defense. Um, it is satellites. Yeah, this one, if I'm not mistaken, this is a very strange ability because if one player researches satellites, it has the same effect for everybody in the game everybody will see the map revealed. Now, you can't like look in the units. It doesn't clear like the the complete fog of war, uh, but you'll see like all the land masses and everything like that. Okay, let's talk about what we do at the start of a game. So there's a few things we do. The first is that you can still pop settlers or cities in a future start or a modern start game. So the first thing that I would do is I would chop out an explorer. The second thing I'd do is that I would switch governments. So you start with all the good governments and the bad ones too. <laughs> it's not like you don't start with monarchy, uh, but you start with all the governments. 
So you can take your pick at the start of the game. You're chopping out your explorer anyway, so it's not like you were doing much. Um, it will be between two and six turns if you're a non-religious sieve. If you wait, that time will get larger because as your empire expands, your anarchy time will grow. So right now it's not so bad, two to six turns. You can check the anarchy time. We got four here. Okay, so we can chop out our explorer and we will have to choose our government. So um, modern and future start are actually like weirdo topsy-turvy Civ 3 where the bad governments are good and the good governments are bad. Um, because right now, right here, democracy and fascism are actually super, super playable. This is because typically worker speed matters for almost nothing. Like it helps you rail faster, but typically you have all your tile improvements done by this point in a single player game. But since we're just beginning a single player game, we have to do all of our time or all of our tile improvements. We also have to do a bunch of chopping. So playing a government with fast workers is actually quite valuable. Um, fascism is basically just like a strictly buffed uh, monarchy in a lot of ways. The only downside is like you lose a worker population when you switch into it. Um, sorry, you lo lose population in your cities, but you don't have any cities right now. So it should be fine switching in. Just like don't accidentally let your capital grow to size two while you're in anarchy. Otherwise, it will lower you down to size one. So fascism is completely playable. Democracy, if you don't end up at war, democracy is pretty good because you're going to be over the unit cap all the time. And if I'm over the unit cap, I'd much rather be paying one gold per turn per unit, which is completely manageable at this point of the game, versus Republic, which you're paying, for the most part, two gold per unit. Uh, Republic would probably still be playable, but I would take democracy between the two of them. Um, but fun fact, again, a lot of the things that are bad in the base game are actually kind of good in modern or future start. Um, so, for example, the Explorer or the Conquistador unique unit would be disgusting in this scenario. Um, but Explorer, like, you can, like, pillage people's tiles with Explorer. Like, imagine if some we irrigated this tile and somebody just rolled up with an Explorer and just started pillaging it. What are we going to do? Are we going to spend 35 shields on a rifleman to kill their Explorer? No, that's ridiculous. And here you see the radar towers, and that's what the AI does. So, yeah, um, I'd say play Fascism or play Democracy. These are good choices of governments. First thing you do, chop out an explorer, and then get your granary. Oh, also, there's no despotism penalty, so go ahead and irrigate. Irrigate grassland, irrigate plains sugar. It's all good. Okay, let's talk about the advanced worker moves you start with. Um, so, one thing is railroads. You see I have coal here, there's iron here. I'm immediately beelining towards the coal. I actually do one road per turn with the bonus from democracy and the bonus from being industrious. Uh, so I'm going to get that... Uh, iron hooked so I can do railroads. Railroads are just like disgustingly OP. Two res might be a lot, but uh, if you can, secure them. Um, not as important as oil, but still very, very important if you can. Um, the next worker move is the radar tower. So the radar tower will give you a 25% combat bonus to all types of combat within two tiles of the radar tower. So if we put it down here, then any combat going on on these tiles will receive a bonus. So that includes air combat, includes land combat. I believe it actually includes bombardment too. So it provides some resistance against like being, um, like having a naked city bombed by a bomber or like a cruise missile or something like that. Uh, maybe even naval units too, but uh, I'd like to see some more testing on that. Uh, but yes, it is very strong. So if you're defending a city in the modern era, just put down a radar tower. It is just so easy to do. Next point is air bases. So air bases are here. Oh, note that the, we built the radar tower here. It didn't remove the mine, but if we build a airfield, it actually will remove the mine. Interesting quirk. Um, so I would put it on maybe a forest or like an unimproved tile like this. It won't remove the road. So what air bases do is they act like airports. So you can airlift one unit every turn from the air base. So control shift T or shift T, sorry. And you can fly it to any other airbase or any other airport. You might notice that an airport costs, what, 100 shields, maybe 50 if you're militaristic, something very expensive like that. This costs you one worker. So this is a much cheaper option. So I would definitely go with this um, if you need to move units across continents or to like a small island. Um, this is a good way to do it. Much better than using a helicopter or something like that. Um, so yeah, you can airlift units. Um, one thing is that you can obviously rebase planes into this, and this is my preferred method if you want to get your stack of bombers to another continent. Do not put them in the city, 
Because if you put them on, in the city on the continent that you're just taking, then the city might flip and then you would lose all your bombers. Uh, do not use carriers. Carriers are so expensive, there's no point. Just take one city however you can, plop down an airfield, and then you can guard that airfield. The AI doesn't really target your bombers anyway if they're in an airfield, so don't worry too much about that. Interestingly though, air units. So they are the first unit to get targeted in a city if it gets bombed, but they cannot be targeted at all if they're on an airfield. So this is a bug. So again, if we have bombers here, if we have three bombers here and somebody bombs the city, it will almost certainly hit the bombers. If we have bombers here in this air base and somebody bombs this tile, it will never hit the bombers. Even if you kill all the land units on top of the bombers, you cannot do damage through bombardment to an air unit on an airfield tile. So for that reason, airfields are really good for putting a big stack of bombers near the enemy. Also, if you're worried about like your interceptors being sh shot out of the cities, like while they're getting set up, the enemy could like bomb the city and destroy your, your fighters or whatever before they even get to do anything. So what you can do there is you can plop down an airbase, put the fighters in the airbase, and then rebase them there so that they're safe uh, and cannot be targeted by the enemy bombardment. Now, I mean, they can still fail to intercept, but they cannot be bombed out. So I actually wanted to test some of my ideas about radar towers. So I made a little scenario so we can see how it works. Um, so what will happen is I've turned off all defense bonuses and I've given these units a bunch of extra HP. So with the bigger sample size, because of the higher HP values and then 50 units in each stack, we should get a good representation of whether a bonus is actually occurring or not. So like I said, within two tiles, of the radar tower, you will get a 25% bonus. These don't stack, by the way, if you have multiple radar towers. Um, so what we're going to do here is we will attack. So 50 galleys against 50 galleys. So we won 34 out of 50 combats, so far above 50%. Um, that was due to the presence of the radar tower. Same thing here. We're under the radar tower. We win 38 out of 50. And then here... This is one thing I was wondering, right? So this unit is outside of the ray tower, but my attacker is inside. Does that count as inside or outside? And from my experiment, I think it counts as um, outside, actually. So I'll show you again. We'll do another sample. Let's show you one more time. Yeah, 24. This is more in line with what I'm expecting. So basically, a uh, complete coin flip whether I win or lose the combats or not. Again decimating 39 left over here, 37, because we are getting the bonus from the radar tower. What this means is that radar tower does work for naval combat. It works for land combat. Um, if you are having an inside, but you're attacking unit that's outside the radar tower, that does not count. You do not get the radar tower bonus in that case. But I imagine if they attacked me, I would get that bonus in that case. Okay, next point on our list is drafting. So what drafting means is you right click on the city, you click draft unit, you will lose one population, you will take 20 turns of one unhappy face, and it will give you one conscript unit. So the conscript unit will have minus one health re relative to the regular unit, but it will promote uh, faster if it's a draft. Um, so yeah, you see the population in Jakarta goes down to uh, six population from seven. You must be at least size seven to draft. So um, in a modern or future start, uh, in a multiplayer mod, you have an aqueduct in your capital automatically. Uh, but make sure to get that aqueduct so you can produce these cheap units. It is totally worth it uh, in exchange for the population and the unhappiness to get a quick unit so you can guard yourself. Um, and if you are in a government with military police, the military police will make up for the unhappiness for 20 turns. And then after 20 turns, you just have free happiness from the unit. So uh, drafting is actually quite strong, especially if you are playing a modern or future start game. Um, interestingly enough, the unit that will be drafted is the unit with the highest defense that you can build. If two units are tied for whatever reason for the highest def defense, this is very bizarre, but it will choose the one with the lower attack in that case. Um, so in practice, what that means is you'll get a rifleman, uh, or you, if you can build an infantry, you'll get an infantry. If you can get a mech, you'll build a mech. Um, sorry, Tau first, and then mech, uh, if you have the tech for whatever those units are that I just said. Um, so yeah, those would be the four units you can draft in a base game of Civ 3. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about is mobilization. So mobilization is also referred to as wartime. This is an extremely powerful ability that a lot of people don't use. So let's take a look at what it does. So right here, mobilization, you can switch from normal to wartime. 
Um, this is a misconception. It's not like inherently linked to being at war. You can switch into wartime at any time. Um, right now, if we want to, we can switch into wartime, even though you'll see we are not at war with anyone. So we're going to do that now. Wartime. Oh, those numbers just changed. So what wartime does is it means you cannot build any building or wonder that does not have the militaristic flag. So buildings like the barracks, the airport, the harbor, these are buildings that are twice as fast if you are militaristic. So that means you actually can build these buildings in wartime. Any other building, even if it is arguably a building that is useful for wartime, uh, you cannot build in wartime. So things like um, an aqueduct to get to size 7 so you can draft or get the defense bonus, no, you're out of luck. Uh, a border, like a temple in a city you just took because you don't want it to flip, no, sorry, you cannot build that in wartime. Uh, but you do get an incredible production bonus towards uh, certain types of units. So let's look at that now. So notice how this is actually the same bonus as being in a golden age, right? You know how incredibly powerful being in a golden age is for early war? The exact same thing is true um, for being in wartime mode. This is an extremely powerful bonus to production. So any tile that produces a shield already, so for example, this tile produces two shields, will produce one more instead. This tile produces zero shields, so it still produces zero shields. For this reason, I would recommend you irrigate your bonus grasslands. Uh, but don't irrigate regular grasslands. You want to mine a regular grassland because that way you still get the wartime bonus and the golden age bonus um, if you are in wartime mode. So I said certain types of units. The fighter is one of those units. So any ground, like boots on the ground, land unit, you will get that bonus. Buildings, you won't. Okay. So let's uh, let's get rid of these shields, actually. Um, so yeah, you'll notice we're not getting the bonus shields towards wealth. Towards barracks, we're not getting the shields. Walls, no. Um, but any of these boots on the ground, any units with an attack and defense value uh, that is a land unit, you will get the bonus. So you'll see the extra shields here. Same thing here. Artillery, no, for, for some reason. Okay. Um, artillery, no. Any interceptor planes? Yes. Um, most, not like a transport, like the unit, the transport, or the galleon. Um, but any, like, offensive ship, yes. Um, and for some reason, the carrier, yes. Like, it's kind of random in that sense. Helicopter, no. Um, cruise missile, no. Any, like, artillery unit, any bombard unit uh, that doesn't have, like, an attack and defense unit, no. Uh, flax, yes. And interestingly enough, the, the stealth fighter, despite, like I said, it cannot it does not have the ability to intercept. But because it has an attack value... Um, you do get the bonus towards the stealth fighter. But that's not the end all and be all of everything, right? So like I said, let's say we want the barracks, but this is going to take five turns. We don't have patience for that. So what we can do is we can start production on, let's say, a fighter. We're getting 14 shields plus one in the box. We're going to end the turn. And now we have 15 shields in the box, right? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that is 15 shields. So notice if we switch to the barracks, we still have those 15 shields. So what you can do is you can start with a unit that does get the bonus and use it as a pre-build. And when you get close to finishing that unit, you switch to the unit you really want. Um, so we could get the barracks in three turns here instead of getting it in five. So this is very powerful if you micromanage to do that. So you'll notice in the most recent stream I did, um, Industrial Era as Babylon, when I was building artillery, I would start with like infantry or cavalry. And then when I got close to having 80 shields or 90 shields in the box, I would switch to the artillery so that I'm still getting the wartime bonus during production, but I get the thing I actually want, which is the artillery. Crazily enough, you can actually use this to get peacetime buildings. So again, once these shields are in the box, they're there in the box, right? It's not like if you chop and you switch to a wonder, uh, where it won't let you switch to a wonder. No, those shields are just there. So you can use those shields for whatever you want. So what this means is I cannot build, for example, I don't know, the Mausoleum of Mausolus. But if I could exit wartime, I would still have these shields and I could switch to the Mausoleum of Mausolus. So what this means is if you're about to exit wartime, what I would do, if, if you're done building units, I would like build something big. Like maybe like a battleship in your capital. How much is a battleship? Okay, so that's 200 shields. You can get like 180 shields in your cap or 190 of wartime shields. Again, this is almost twice as fast. Like the wartime bonus, it's about maybe 60-70% uh, protection production bonus effectively. So you could get like a free like 60-70 shields off the wartime bonus. And then you get your factory instead. Um, you would just have to time it carefully 
and exit wartime at the right time. So I didn't tell you how to exit wartime, I'm going to tell you now. There are two ways to exit wartime. The first is you make peace with literally any civilization, it will end wartime. The other thing is if one of the civilizations you are fighting with dies, they get eliminated from the game, you will exit wartime. Okay, so that might be quite hard. You can get stuck in wartime in some cases, especially like right now, right? Because I haven't declared war on anybody yet. I'm not going to kill anybody and I can't make peace with anybody. So I would have to declare war on somebody, wait six or seven turns, or it could be like nine or ten or eleven if you've, we've been at war a lot, before they'll even like consider the possibility of peace with me. And then at that point, I could like get peace and then exit wartime. So plan your war times and your out of wars carefully because you are stuck there. Uh, what this means is if you want to be using wartime mode, maybe like just declare war on like some random civ, like especially a weak civ on the other side of the map. Uh, that way you have the option whenever you want. If you want to exit wartime, you could just call them up. Hey, let's make peace and you will exit wartime mode in that case. Okay, last point will be units. I'd like to do a full tier list at some point, but just as a quick overview, Bombers and artillery are the by far the best units in the game in the modern and future era. Um, there are a lot of bad units, right? I think they just didn't have time to playtest everything. So they just, if they were doing something experimental and interesting, they just made it, made it weak. So cruise missiles are extremely weak. Pretty much no reason to build them. Helicopters are weak. Uh, paratroopers, modern paratroopers in the base game, not in multiplayer, but in the base game, they're just bad, pretty much unusable. And pretty much every single boat. <laughs> Carriers, shit, battleship, destroyer, cruiser, all of those units, just don't build them, right? They just die to bombers so easy. They do have a bit of built-in anti-air, um, but they're just not that good. You shouldn't build them. There are better things you can build. If you can build, avoid building a, uh, a naval unit at any point, just don't build that naval unit because they just don't do enough to justify their extremely, extremely high cost in single-player Civ 3. Okay, that's it for today. Let me know if you guys want to know more about the modern era. I'd be happy to make an additional video on the subject. Maybe a, a tier list on units would be fun. Um, but yeah, but that's all for today. I'll see you guys next time.